20. How many know you can still grow during a pandemic, right? Yes. Right. So uh, my ministry team is planning an event in December, I believe, yeah. where the ministers are going to come forth and we're going to do like a, a little tag team, a rodeo preaching style, and we're just going to all share what God has been doing in our lives. And we're also going to open up the mic for you so that you can share how you have grown in 2020. Are you growing? Yes. Amen. So, and also, uh, we have a, a theme for next year, and we're going to release that soon. <laughs> See, I, I was just about to say something, and then I heard a voice of the Holy Spirit said, don't do that yet. So, uh, you have to be obedient. But we do have a theme for next year, and I think the theme is going to continue with our growth theme, and we're just really going to be blessed. We started a sermon series called Prayer. And uh, we're going to continue in that sermon series today. But I just want to take this time out right now and uh, congratulate uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris for uh, winning the uh, 20, 2020 uh, election. Uh, now, for those of you who've been coming to Kadosh, I said the same thing when President Trump uh, won his presidency. I said congratulations. So it's just something that we say we're very courteous. It's honor, right? Give honor where honor is due. So we congratulate uh, them. And besides that, it is a great accomplishment uh, because of the sheer number of people that went out to the polls to vote. They never had a turnout like that before. So congratulations to you also who voted. And I also want to say that for those of you who are not joining us in prayer, I want to give you a personal invitation to meet us at 5.30 every Wednesday um, for prayer. Now, y'all, I'm telling you, I can probably take 15 minutes to tell you how Holy Spirit is really moving in prayer, but I won't. I won't. He's speaking prophetically. He's given us dreams. He's given us vision. He's given us direction. Um, we're pulling down strongholds. I want to let you know about three books at our prayer team ministry, and I just feel the breath of God. Uh, three books that our prayer team ministry has been asked to read for their own personal growth, and I just wanted to share it with you in case you wanted to uh, grow along with us in prayer. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So one of our books is called Let Us Pray by Watchman Nee. Let Us Pray by Watchman Nee. When you pray, you invite Holy Spirit into your situation to move. The other book is The Discerning of Spirits by Frank Hammond. Very thin book. You can probably use this as your devotional read for a week. You just read a few pages a, a day. You look those scriptures up in your Bible and you learn. It's called The Discerning of Spirits by Frank Hammond. You've got to try the spirit by the spirit. And every spirit that says that they love Jesus is not the spirit of the Lord. So you have to discern spirit so that you can help people. Lastly, the stronghold of unbelief. And this spirit was exposed on Wednesday night. The stronghold of unbelief, and it's by Frank Hammond, by Frank Hammond, Dorman, Duggan, and Frank Hammond. The stronghold of unbelief. The enemy will try to, he will allow you to come to church on Sunday and say amen and witness. But then when you leave, he will try to snatch the seed from you. The seed is the DNA of God's heart. And so the, whole, the, so the enemy will try to snatch that seed from you and you'll be in belief in the next hour and then in unbelief for the rest amen. of the week. Mm. So I want you to get the stronghold of unbelief and overthrow that demonic <laughs> presence in the, in the heart of your mind. Amen. amen. Hey Amen. We also like to uh, welcome you who are joining us online. Uh, we appreciate you uh, taking time to allow us in your car, in your living room, and even on your job Jesus. for this hour of worship. So, yes. and we also want to let you know that we are open as a church, and you're more than welcome to come join us in person. Yes. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. So uh, we started this prayer series, and uh, we're going to continue with it until God releases us from it, because prayer is very important, especially during a time like this. Uh, it doesn't matter which side of the political divide that you're on. We know that there's something going on right now in America that just isn't right. And the only way it's going to change is prayer. Prayer is going to change our hearts. We need to position ourselves to hear from God and not hear from uh, all of this political stuff that's going on in the world. So we're going to look at Jonah because, uh, you know, God puts these lessons together and I can't take credit for, for it at all, right? It just seems like every time he speaks to Kadosh, it's right I'm in line. I'm so, it's so true. It's so true. Uh -huh. Did you miss, um, we were on, glory! See y'all, when you in the vein, you in the vein. When we were we were on a director's Zoom meeting yesterday, and uh, Miss Roslyn mentioned Jonah. I just about jumped out of my seat, and then this morning I was listening to a man of God, and guess Jonah. who he mentioned? Jonah. Jonah. <laughs> Let every word be a step. Pastor Gary, you didn't say that with enough oh. energy. Let me try it again. And so I was listening to the man of God this morning, and guess who he mentioned? Jonah. Yes, he did. <laughs> Let every man, every word be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Can we shut that door? My OCD is uh, kicking in. And I, I won't be able. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just will be distracted the whole service looking at that door. Right? Father God. Help me, Jesus. Right? <laughs> so uh, we're going we're gonna to continue on in and, and our, and our prayer series, The Art of War, because prayer is warfare. If you don't take anything else away from this whole series, you need to understand that prayer is warfare. Yes. And now, the enemy doesn't want us to get this, y'all. Mm -hmm. So let's go to Jonah, the book of Jonah. Jonah should be a very familiar book, uh, especially for kids. It, it has a great story in there. talks about uh, Jonah and the big fish. And we're going to look at the book of Jonah this morning. Like I said, it's a very popular story uh, for children, and it's a very popular story for us to read as adults. Yes. When we look at the story of Jonah, it has all the excitement in it of a good story. We have rebellion. We have a, a storm at sea. We have a, um, an enormous fish swallowing someone whole. We have someone who refuses to go to an alien land to teach the people. I mean, it's just all these adventures are going on in the book of Jonah. But there's one thing I want you to realize in the book of Jonah, too. We finally see the acknowledgement of the sovereignty of God. We see the surrender to God's plan, and we see a prayer and deliverance take, takes place all in the book of Jonah. So I want to go to Jonah chapter 1. Yes. Jonah chapter 1. And I want to start at verse 15. Now, I want you to see yourself in this story because I, I think we can all, we all have rebellion sometime. I know we say rebellion is at the sin of witchcraft and no one wants to be called a witch. But, but you, you know, I'm not saying witchy poo, but we all got a little... <laughs> A little witch inside of us, right? So in the story of Jonah, you know, you know, uh, if I see some straw laying around, it's probably coming from your broom, right? So <laughs> we're going to look at this story. Like I said, it has, it has rebellion in it. It has resistance in it. And it also has belief in it. So, Father, upon the hearing of your living word, I want to let the enemy know that we know that this is a living word and that this is not dead words written on old parchment paper, yes, Lord. but this is the living, breathing word of God. Therefore, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you in our hearing will teach our fingers to fight and our hands to war against the spirit of rebellion. Yes. I pray, Lord God, that we are regurgitated out of the, of the fish's belly today. I pray that generations of blessings are yes, vomited Lord. up today. In the name of Jesus, I pray that the Nineveh in our heart will be ministered to by Holy Spirit, that we will administer to yes, others Lord. the grace of God, and we consider it done in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Jonah chapter 1 verse 15. We're going to burn some brooms today. Hallelujah. Amen. So they took <laughs> up Jonah. Calm down, Elaine. Calm down. Jonah 1, 15. Because mm -hmm. I am fired up. 
So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Mm -hmm. So when we look at this text, uh, we're sort of picking it up. We didn't want to go all the way back to uh, the first verse. But what happens is, is Jonah is given instructions. Yeah. And the instruction says, go out and cry against Nineveh, yeah. right? That, that great wicked city, right? Mm -hmm. But Jonah refused to do so because uh, Jonah is saying, why should I go preach salvation to my enemy? Did you hear what I just said? Jonah is saying to the Lord, why should I go preach salvation to my enemies, right? So he refused to do it. So God tells him to go one direction. He hops on a boat and goes 500 miles in the opposite direction. So here he is on this ship. And, uh, and the thing about this ship that he's on, right, it's full of unbelievers. It's full. Well, I don't want to say unbelievers. They believe in just about anything, right? Yeah, they, these are yeah. these are sailors, right? Who have all kind of idols. Look at look at verse fifteen. Okay, so they took up Jonah, and ca wait. First, let me just read verse one just to get this. It says, "Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, uh -huh. the son of Amittai." saying arise that means immediate action right. and it means it is not optional arise and go to Nineveh Lord. that great city and then he says when you get there I want you to cry against it in other words I want you to proclaim a judgment for what for their wickedness is come up before me Mm -hmm. So then he says, so then the whole boat situation happens. And then he tells the people, they're like, the people are like, why is this happening to us? And he says, it's me. Throw me over. So he threw, they, the, the men on the, on the ship threw Jonah over. So they took up Jonah right. and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Mm -hmm. Verse 16. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. I want you to see something in this text, right? Uh, Jonah received a word from the Lord. That word that he received had instructions yes. with it, right? Yes. Now, I want you to understand that Jonah is a prophet. Yes. Prophets hear the voice of the Lord, and prophets share what the voice of the Lord is saying. And prophets do this to save a nation, to save people, right? But Jonah didn't understand his gift, and he thought that his gift was only for certain people. But God said, no, I gave you your gift, and you will use your gift the way I intended for you to use it. We don't get to pick and choose who we share our gift with. The gift is not ours. It comes from the Lord, right? So the, so the scripture says that they pick him up and threw him over. Now, I want you to understand the, the rebellion, how deep-seated this rebellion is. Jonah basically said to the Lord, I would rather die. Than to do what you told me to do. Do you hear that? He said, I would rather die than to deliver this word of salvation to the enemy. I would rather die. Look at verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. It's very interesting. Jonah said that I would rather die than to preach to heathens, than to preach to a wicked nation. But the men who he perceived to be wicked, the men who he perceived to only worship idols, they were obedient to the Lord. They said, what, you need to go for your Lord's sake? <laughs> Throw him over. Throw him over. Throw him over. Get rid of him. It's amazing how our so-called unsaved friends obey the Lord better than we do. Threw him right over, boy. Look at verse 17 again. Okay. Now the Lord had prepared... Let's not read the scripture as judgment against Jonah. Like, mm, Jonah, you should have known. No, today we are Jonah. Mm -hmm. So where Jonah's name is, put your name there. Now the Lord, and so the Lord prepares a cavity to throw you in, to throw us in, mm -hmm. until we decide to say, yes, Lord. Wow. Now the Lord, the Lord prepared a great fish mm -hmm. to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. 
I want to say this, and I want to make a point, and I hope you don't miss this point. Even in the heat of his rebellion, God made provisions for Jonah. That's a word for us. In the midst of deep rebellion, in the midst of wanting to sacrifice his life and rather than do the Lord's will, the God said, I'm not finished with you yet. Y'all, that's serious, y'all. That Thank you, Jesus. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Like every single one of us are on the altar this morning. Mm -hmm. Let's go to chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1. Then Jonah did what? Pray. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God. And I. this is what I just hear the Lord saying. Some, see, this thing of salvation is a progression. It's, it's right. progressive. Like mm -hmm. the sanctification is a, pro, is a process. So we have to know that we are doing fantastic things in the Lord. That we are obeying the Lord in a lot of areas. We are. Mm -hmm. And he is using us mightily. And the anointing is upon us. And he's using us to help other people destroy the yoke. But there's something called the law of the lid. Right. And you can only take people as far as where you are. That's right. And so what the Holy Spirit is doing is he wants to lift the lid and show us some leaven in our life. So don't allow the enemy to say, well, you're doing good. You're in his will. Mm -hmm. You're doing, you're, no. Right. Everybody has leaven. And this is the opportunity for a seed to be planted mm. in our heart, an exposure of our heart to be manifest on the altar so that the lid can be raised yes. so that we can operate in the cinnamon and in the calamus and in the, in the anointing of God yes. that we can go out into the cities and destroy the yokes of bondage that are upon the necks of the people. Mm. Amen. Okay, so let's not say I'm doing so great and I'm doing so well. We need to pray, Lord, expose me this morning. We give you permission to expose yes, us Lord. so that the law of the lid can be raised in the name of Jesus. You, you know, I want you to understand the sovereignty of God here, right? Uh, when we try to run away from God and get on a ship and go 500 miles out of our way to avoid God, all of a sudden a storm hits our life. The storm not only hits our life, but it affected everyone around us. When Jonah was on that ship in the midst of the storm, it not only affected Jonah, but it affected all of the sailors, right? God is going to get our attention one way or the other. And here's another thing that's coming to me. As we've been reading, does anybody sense the breath of God, like the anointing? Mm -hmm. So as we've been reading about the, uh, the, the war, the art of war, yes. we remember how um, Abraham prayed for the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. And then we remember how Moses, no, Nehemiah prayed to rebuild the city walls. Right. So what is happening? And now, oh boy, right here, God is telling him to go <laughs> pray for the city of Nineveh. When we are kingdom minded... And when we're praying and we have a relationship yes. with the Lord, kingdom prayers is not going to be about I, me, my, and mine. Mm -hmm. It will on a certain level. But on a kingdom level, it is outside of I, me, my, and mine. It is about the city of Wayne County or the city where your loved yes. ones reside. So God is shifting us from I, me, my, and mine. Uh -huh. And I'm not saying don't pray for I, me, my, and mine because you need to. That's right. But do you know that you have an anointing to, on your own to pray for I, me, my, and mine? Mm -hmm. Now, there are times that you, you get weak and you need to lift up your arms. I understand that. But what God is saying, he's saying the city is in a bad place. Mm -hmm. And I'm anointing you to bring a revival to the city. I'm anointing you to bring a revival to the nation. Right. The, then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly now that word then i don't yeah. want us to brush over that word yeah. too quickly right because at the end of verse uh of chapter one it says that jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights right he was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights smelling that the dead stuff in the side of the fish the belly right yeah. the moisture it was dark in there right the 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 acids of the fish stomach was breaking down all of the stuff around him right 
But yet, it don't say that as soon as Jonah went into the belly of the fish, he prayed. It says that he was in there three days and three nights. God will let us sit in our mess until we cry out to him. He said, okay, Jonah, you must like the way it smells inside of this fish. You must like being in a dark place. So he was there for three days and three nights. And then in the very next chapter, it says, then, then, only then did Jonah pray. Look now at it again. that word prayed means intervene or negotiate with mm -hmm. God. That word prayed means interpose, which means to intrude the courtroom, to interfere with what's going on, and to mediate, to intercede means to to plea and entreat God. So can you imagine, have you ever been in such a low place that there's this groaning that comes up out yes. of you and this cry that comes up out of you for help? That's where he is. Mm -hmm. And then it says that unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. Now that word belly means that he was in the bowels or the intestines yes. or the womb of the belly. I want to show you now, I don't know what fish it was because the scripture doesn't say so. But if you see this, it's, this is called the blue whale. Uh -huh. Look at the size of this whale compared to Jonah. Now, I know that Jonah was not a scuba diver. Scuba, scuba diver. I'm showing you this picture so that mm -hmm. you can get, uh, you know, that depiction in your mind. Yes, that you've yes. just been thrown overboard. And you're getting ready to be swallowed up by this great mammal. Mm. And then if you go to the next slide... I wish I had my red little thingy, but if you look at the at the fish's the fish's mouth and it goes all the way down past his eye, and then you see this this tubular thing. Uh -huh. It says that's his trachea. You see that? Then it then he went past his shoulder blade, and then he's in his he's in his digestive tract. Right. And then he ends up you know, in that blue area, which is his stomach. Do you see that blue area? So he, I don't know how long it took for him. Thank you, Victoria. Let's see. Does it work? Oh, gosh. Shania, it don't work. Okay. But you see the blue. You see... <laughs> You see this blue here where it says his stomach. So he gets swallowed up. I don't know. He gets swallowed up. We're going to see that he goes all the way down to the bottom. He gets swallowed up. He goes past his trachea, yes, past. Yes. I don't know how long that took. And then he ends up in this bubble called the, the stomach. It, it's also known as the grave. And there was another man that I know that was in the grave for three days. And then he rose up. Yes, 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 yes. So now, then it's, okay, go ahead. Now when we look at uh, verses 2 through 9. Yeah. This is Jonah telling his story from inside of the fish's belly, right? Oh, God. And, I, and said, I cried by reason of my affliction mm -hmm. unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Listen. I don't care what dark, smelly, wet, damp place you find yourself in or we find ourselves in. We can cry out from the very pit of hell and God will hear our cry. Do you see that in the text? Yes. And said, I cried. That cried means to summons. Mm -hmm. So when you are in that place of affliction, your cry your howl, yes, yes. your moan, your travail is summonsing God. Mm. It's almost like God keeps you there and he, he turns his, his face from you. Father, yes. why hast thou forsaken me? God, help me. Mm. Come, God. Have you ever been in that place? And then it says, so he summons God. And said, I cried by, why did he summons him? Because he was in a place of affliction. And yeah. who did he cry to? He cried to the Lord. And he says, when I summons, when I cried out to the Lord, it says that he heard me from where? From the hell that I was in. Now, one of the things I, I want to say right here, it does not say that Jonah repented. <laughs> do, do you see that in the text anywhere, right? 
Jonah is crying out to God in his rebellious state. He has not repented. Why hasn't he repented? Because he hasn't had a change of heart yet. Only reason he's crying out to God because he is afflicted right now. His heart didn't change. Jesus. And said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Shama. Heardest means shama. Mm -hmm. It means that he, God listened to him. He took heed yes. to the noise or to his voice. That's right. Verse 3. For thou hadst cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about, and all... All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Now, it's very interesting because uh, in chapter 1, it tells us that the sailors threw Jonah in the sea, right? Yeah. But Jonah yeah. knows exactly who's responsible yeah. for him being in the sea. Yes. And he says God yes. is the one that put him in this situation. So it says that he cast me into the deep. And this is a picture that I found. I love Google Images. Um... Can you imagine you just went, they just threw you overboard. And you know when you jump into a pool or if you jump into a lake, you go uh -huh. down. And then eventually you come back up. But he didn't come back up right away. So just imagine if there's a storm, they threw him overboard, he goes down. The fish obeyed the, the word of the Lord, goes and swallows him up. And then he goes through the process of being placed in his belly in the deep. Can you imagine that? That's scary to me. You're in the deepest part of the earth. Mm -hmm. In the deepest part of the pit of hell that God uses through one of his animals. And then we cry out to God. Wow. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas. Mm -hmm. Jesus. And the floods compassed me about. All thy billows, thy waves passed over me. Right. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. It's amazing that as, as, as he's falling in this water, as this water is encompassing him, as he's surrounded, as death is at his door, it says, yet I look toward your holy temple. You know, and we find ourselves in these situations a lot. It's like when all hope is gone, that's when we look toward his holy temple. But if you remember, he wanted to be in this situation in the first place because he refused to do what God commanded him to do. Look at verse 5. Now, now, don't forget that he cries out to the holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. Mm -hmm. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped around my head. So when he says this water is surrounding me, even to my soul, he is saying my mind, my will, my emotions, everything knows that this is the end. I'm done. This, this water is so into me right now. I, I'm done. I'm, I'm finished. No right? hope. He didn't have any hope. Mm -mm. When a person is in that space, you can pray for them. But you cannot jump into the pit with them and try to pull them out. They have to choose. My husband, my husband's taught me that when a person is drowning, you don't try to save them when they're thrashing around. Because what will happen? They'll pull you down too and both of you all will drown. You've got to wait. You've got to go and it's, it's, calm down. I'm trying to grab up. Matter of fact, they throw out the buoy, the little round thing. They say, catch that. Because if they try to use you, they're going to pull you down. So if you try to throw somebody the truth, if you try to throw them the seed, if you try to throw right. them some help, and then, and then they tell you, you don't understand where I'm coming from. You ain't going through what I'm going through. Then you got to leave them there a little while longer. As a matter of fact, uh, most lifeguards will tell you, we'll save you when you drown. Because then they can pull you out. Because <laughs> there's no fight left in you then. So when you finally take in enough water where it takes the fight out of you, then we're going to pull you out of the water and pump that water 
out of you. Because they tell you, grab a hold to this. Grab a hold to this, not me. Grab a hold to the word. Go to the holy temple. Hold on to the horns of the altar. Saturate yourself in the blood. Go find some yes, hope yes, in yes. the scripture. My motto is, you ain't killing me. No, and I, man, let me tell you something. If you are an over-functioner, I have learned that I am an over-functioner. Mm -hmm. If you over-function, then you take it upon yourself to help and help yes, and help yes. and help. And then you'll throw yourself in the, in, the, in the water. And then you'll go find the whale and swim and pry the whale's mouth open and swim down in there and go past his esophagus and throw yourself inside of the belly and be like, grab my hand. And they're like, no. And you're like, yes, do it. And they're like, I don't want to. And they're like, I'm here to help you. That's so crazy. That's crazy. Ain't that crazy? They're, they're sitting there like, I'm, I'm enjoying this seafood buffet. Why are you here? <laughs> that is called crazy. Stop over-functioning. Mm. Sometimes you've got to leave people in the pit until they are tired of living there. But then what you do is you go to your prayer closet and you say, Father God, in the name of yes, Jesus, yes, yes, yes. I come to the courtroom on behalf of so-and-so. Their name is on the docket. The enemy has taken their mind. Their head is encompassed around with weeds. God, they can't hear you. God, they can't see you. But I pray in the name of Jesus that you will send your yes, word yes. in the belly of the whale, in the pit of hell, God. Mm. That's what you do. Leave them in there. Leave them in there. They're going to talk about you. They're going to say you don't love them. They're going to do that. Yes. Leave them there. Once they get the revelation, they'll say thank you. Mm. Once they stop fighting. Verse, verse 5 and oh 6. Oh, my God. The waters compass me about, even to the soul. The depth clothes me yes. round about. The weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, y'all. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Now when he says that the earth and the bars closed behind me, it, it was just like the, de the door of death. He saw that, that door closing. He said, yet, yeah, you know, I, I can see it right now. My, the door is closing. My life is about to be cut off. But he says, yet, yet you brought me up. You brought, my, you brought me up my life from the pit, O oh Lord, my God. So he brought him up. So, and that's what God wants to do. Sometimes we, we go down to our lowest state mm. so that God can lift us up, right? But he's not lifting us up until we lift him up. Remember, Jonah cried out yes, to him yes, first, right? He did. he did. He cried out to him first. Then it says in verse 7, when my soul fainted, meaning when I gave up all hope, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. You know, it's amazing. As I was reading this story, he is not remembering his assignment. <laughs> the reason you're there, Jonah, is because you neglected your assignment. So all of these prayers, all of this crying out you're doing, you're only focusing on yourself, right? He's only concerned about himself, right? He still hasn't remembered what God told him to do, but yet God is patient with him. So here, I want us to really hone in on this word in verse 7 called remembered. It's the Hebrew word zakar. Mm -hmm. Now, please get this because there's a revelation here in the remembering, in the zakar. It's not merely to rifle through the files in your head until yes. you find that fact you've been searching for. Mm -hmm. To zakar is to employ your hands and feet and lips to engage in whatever action that yes. remembrance requires. Because remember, in Hebrew thought, it's, we, we are a verb. So remember is not just an action in your head. It's, it's not just a, a thought in your head. It's not just a noun. Zakar is actually something that you have to do. 
So when you remember, it's, it actually means that you are getting up and you're putting your hands and your feet and your lips to the place of obedience. Biblical remembering is a body activity, not merely a head activity. Remembrance equals a divine act of mercy. Yes. Listen to, to Genesis 8 and 1 in, in terms of Noah, trying to teach you what it means to remember. It doesn't mean that you're going to sit down and remember Noah yes. and remember Abraham. and remember, They actually did something. Nehemiah actually built the wall. Um, Abraham actually prayed. Noah actually had to build the ark. Like, everybody had to do something. That's what it means to remember. Mm -hmm. Genesis 8 and 1. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a window blow over the earth and the water subsided. Wow. So when God remembered Noah, God did something. Are you with me? Uh Let's look and see um, the remembrance of a covenant in Genesis 9, 15. I will remember, remember my covenant between me and you and all the living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. So he gave us the rainbow. That is an act of divine mercy. Mm -hmm. Let's look again in Genesis 19, 29. Hallelujah. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham. And he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot lived. So we see that wherever there is God's remembrance of us, it means that God actually does something. Mm -hmm. So in order for us to get to that place of remembrance, we actually, factually, without a shadow of a doubt, have to do something. And when we do it, it means that we are remembering what God has spoken to us. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Yes. Now look at verse 7 again. Woo! When my soul fainted within me, Mm-hmm. I remembered, that means to recall to mind the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. Now, I want you to understand that he only, this is, this verse 7 talks about a surrender, right? Jesus. He only surrendered when, his, when he had no more strength left, right? It says that he was about to faint. My soul was about to faint in me. So basically what he's telling God is, I don't have any more fight left. I don't have any more fight left. I can't fight you anymore, God, physically. I can't fight you physically anymore. But he still hasn't given up the fight in his heart yet. And I'm going to show you that later on in uh, chapter 4. So he is no longer going to fight God physically because he can't. So since he can't fight God physically, he's going to surrender to God's plan, but the rebellion is still in his heart. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered Zakar, recalled to mind the Lord, Mm -hmm. and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. I want to show you a picture of a temple. Yes. So this is Solomon's temple, and you see the outer court, you see the inner court, and the mm-hmm. Holy of Holies. We are now the temple. Mm-hmm. And Holy Spirit now lives on the inside of us. So you've got to move from the outer court where the brazen labor is, the brazen altar is. That's where your flesh has to die. Mm-hmm. Then you've got to go into the inner court where the table of shoe bread is, which is the word of God. Right. And then the light of God. His word, let your light shine before. And then the altar of incense, which is your prayer life. So you die to your flesh. You wash in the word. Mm -hmm. You eat the scroll. You pray the scroll. You light up like the word of God is. Your word is a light unto my. And then you keep going into the holy of holies where the angels are crying. And they're singing this song. And then you're in the presence of the Lord. And then the next slide, you can see 
Mm. Oh my God, I wish I would. So you see the labor, you see the labor right before the wall breaks. You see the labor. That's where you wash it in the word. Then you see the priest standing by a table with, it looks like two stacks of bread. That's mm. 12 pieces of bread. And then the priest stands in front of the altar of incense and that's the prayer. If you go up, if you ascend, if you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, right. then you will be where the angelic host is. You will be where the, 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 the Holy Spirit begins to speak to you mm. and give you instruction. Brothers and sisters, yes. the Bible says, when my soul had given up all hope, mm -hmm. I recalled to mind the Lord. And my prayer came in unto me into thine holy temple. Now everything transitions and he's getting ready to obey the Lord. Hmm. You have to do what God says do. If you allow fear, yes. if you allow, oh, it's going to hurt my feelings, or if I do this, I'm going to be so broken to stop you, you will forever live in the pit of the well of the fish's belly. Verse 8. Verse 8. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. So in, in this particular uh, verse right here, uh, it says those who regard worthless idols yeah. forsake their own mercy. Yeah. Now, this particular verse here speaks to the self-righteousness yes. of Jonah. Right. He, who is he talking about in this verse? He's talking about the sailors, the very, the very sailors who were used by God, who threw him overboard. They had idols. They, they, were, they were worshiping what he called worthless idols for their own mercy's sake, right? But Jonah told them about God. He told them about God, and they say, really? Your God is doing all of this? So once he told them about, once Jonah told them about God, uh, they cried out to God, too, and they threw everything away and got rid of their worthless idols. But in this particular verse, Jonah is basically telling God, yeah, they, they did this. Matter of fact, read verse 9. Let's read okay, verse 9. Okay, okay, But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So he, he's basically telling God, now, he, he, you had mercy on the people that had the worthless idols. But God, you and I both know that they're not going to keep their vow. They're going to go back to serving their worthless idols. But listen to him pump himself up here. But I the, will sacrifice. He said, but I will pay. I will <laughs> sacrifice. I will keep my word, God. I will keep my vow. So Jonah is still in that rebellious state. He is still sitting there seeing himself high up on the throne and that everyone beneath him is worthless. Let's read those verses together, I'm verses 8 and I'm going to read it from another translation. Those who worship false gods, verse 8 and 9, those who worship false gods turn their backs on all God's mercies. But I... I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. And, and uh, God's looking at him like, where are you at right now? <laughs> where are you right now, Jonah? And why are you here, Jonah? Because of rebellion. But he still has that pride in his life. So in the King James, you see, in my Bible, it's different colors. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. It says, I will pay or be at peace that that I have vowed. And then the last portion is highlighted in, in blue, which is where the transition takes place. Mm -hmm. And the transition says salvation is of the Lord. That word salvation in Hebrew is Yeshua. It means victory. It means prosperity. It means welfare. So in the scripture, it's like he's in his, in his own space. And then the transformation of the mind happens when he begins to give all praise to God. Yeah. You know, and what, what's actually happening in this text, oh if you can picture this in your mind, He's at the lowest state, yeah. and he doesn't want to be there anymore. So he's telling God, like many of us, Lord, if you get me out of this, me out of this. 
I'm going to sacrifice to you. I'm going to keep my vows to you. I'm going to do everything you tell me to do, right? And, and, and God says, no. and the scripture says, well, salvation comes from the Lord. Yeah. In other words, God's going to save us because of his righteousness sake, not because of our righteousness, because our righteousness it's is like, as, filthy, it's rag. like filthy rags. So, yeah. so even though we cry out, remember, he's a sovereign God. He knows that we're only crying out that way because we're in trouble. But yet he has a plan. Verse 10. Well, I'll, read the, I'll read the transition part of verse 9 into verse 10. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Now, also when it says salvation is of the Lord... Remember, this all started because God wanted his salvation to go to the city of Nineveh. Nineveh. So even though Jonah is doing all this confession and doing all this thanksgiving and doing all this crying out and making all these vows, listen, salvation is of the Lord. So you're going to do what I told you to do because I told you to do it. And then it says the fish, verse 10. He spit him out. He vomited. He, and the Lord spake unto the fish. And it vomited out Jonah upon the dry. Isn't it amazing how donkeys and fish obey God? Isn't it amazing how we can train a dog but can't train our children? You know, I was just picturing this in my mind as I was studying. You know, it was a pretty big fish. Yeah, huge. And, and for those who fish, big fish don't come too close to the, to the land because they will get stuck, Right. They would get stuck, right? So oh my God. can you imagine the flight that Jonah took out of this fish's mouth, right? When it says that God spoke to the fish, can you imagine Jonah flying through the, oh, through the air, right? Because, I mean, when it's, I don't want I you to think, think I don't want you to that. think that the fish just went up, just yeah, swam up to thought. the. Yeah, <laughs> no. I was like the fish just let him out and swam back. No. It spewed him out. And the scripture says that's what God will do to us. He will spew us out. I mean, you will fly out like, get this nasty taste out of my mouth. Projectile vomiting. Mm -hmm. I don't even, what? Verse 10 again. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Now, Jonah has made a vow that he's going to do what God said, he's, that God told him to do. Let's go to chapter 4 real yes, quick. Yes, y'all. Here we go. Uh, chapter 4. Now, I told you that, you know, a lot of people say, well, Jonah had a change of heart. You know, Jonah was obedient to the Lord. And Jonah, you know, he repented. No, he did not. <laughs> he didn't do it. He still had that, what we call the stinker thing. That's what you call it? The what thing? Stank your dank. The attitude, right? The stank your dank attitude. You know what I'm talking about. He still had that attitude, right? <laughs> say it again. I can't say it anymore, right? <laughs> you got the stank a dank spirit on you. That's right. You, you still smell like that vomit, Jonah, right? Look at verse 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. But no, no, in chapter 3, um, Jonah preaches at Nineveh, and the people believe. Yes. Now, remember that. Right. He, he did. Okay, he did he got do what the God said. Out, he got spewed out. And then he preached to the people, and the people repented and believed. And then, verse chapter 4. Mm -hmm. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. Wait, wait. Who, who did it displease? Jonah. Now, I did say that Jonah was a what? Prophet, right? And a prophet is supposed to share what God is saying so that the people can repent and start worshiping and serving God. But verse 4, chapter, chapter 1 said what? But it displeased. Well, let's I mean, look, chapter 4, verse 1. What, let's, if we read chapter 10, you'll understand. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. But that made Jonah mad, exceedingly mad. Mm. He's mad. Because he wanted God to destroy them. They were his enemies. They were worthless. They worship idols. Th these people are not worth saving. These people are not worth a second chance. These people are not worthy to be in the kingdom with me and you, God. This is what he is saying, right? They're not worthy to share the same residence. They're not worth 
saving. Then he says in verse 2, so he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. Bruh! You know, and, and I, want, I want to read that from the King James because uh, the translation says that he complained unto the Lord. But actually, he prayed. He prayed this prayer to God. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord. Was not this my saying? This is, his, this is his second prayer, right? When I was yet in the country, therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful and slow to angry and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from thee, for it is better for me to die than to live. He goes right back to being thrown back into the water. He says, I wanted to die because I didn't want these people saved, but I knew you, God. I knew you were a gracious God. And I knew that if I shared the gospel, that they would repent and they would be saved. But that's not my will. Well, it ain't about your will in the first place. So as I said earlier, he still had a rebellious heart. Now, this lesson should be very important to all of us because even with our rebellious heart, when God wants to use us and get something out of us, he's going to do it. it. It is better for us to cooperate. It is better for us to be obedient, right? The scripture says, remember, he's trying to sacrifice himself, but the scripture says obedience is what? Better than it's sacrifice. better than sacrifice, right? So he goes back. He, he, he doesn't want to be obedient. He goes right back to sacrifice. Now listen to what God said to him in uh, chapter 4, verse then 4. Then said to the Lord, does thou, does thou, doest thou well to be angry? Another translation says, is it right for you to be angry about this? I look at that like God said, who you mad at, boy? <laughs> I mean, or, or, or who but you think you... Just spirit on you. You ain't going to let that go. <laughs> it, it's like God saying, who do you think, do you think you you're are? talking to? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you're talking to? Let's continue, verse 5. So Jonah went out to the city and sat on the east side, that's where the glory of God comes, of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. So he still thinks that God's going to change his mind for the sake of Jonah and destroy this city. So he goes out and finds him a nice little shade tree, and he said, I'm going to sit right here until I force my will. Do you, hear, do you hear what I'm saying? He said, I'm going to sit right here until I force my will on God. After all, I am a prophet. After all, I have prophesied things that have come to pass. And why shouldn't my prophecy come to pass right now? God, you are embarrassing me. I prophesied this thing out of my own will, and I, expe I expect it <clears throat> to come to pass. But it hasn't come to pass yet. So he is angry with God. I'm going to read verse 5 and 6 from the New Living. Mm -hmm. Then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. Verse 6, and the Lord God arranged, how merciful, arranged for a leafy plant to grow there, and soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. He, he, he is so like, yeah, God, I'm, we're still in. We're still in good standing. Thank, We're still in, thank you. Yeah. Even though you're not listening to me right now, God, I appreciate the shade. Let's continue. But God also arranged for a worm. <laughs> it's amazing to me how, how God just keeps giving him chance after chance after chance to change his heart. God gives us chance after chance after chance to change our rebellious spirit, to change our heart. I mean, he, he's been taking care of Jonah 
from the beginning. Trying to get Jonah to see that it's not your will, Jonah. It's my will. The ways of the Lord are right. Let's continue. Verse 8. Um, is that where I'm at? And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind to blow on Jonah. Remember, the east is, is God. It's mm -hmm. him moving. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished once again that he would die. Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. Listen, Jonah cared more about himself than he cared about the people. This is, this, is a, this is a text about a prophet more concerned about what he thinks should happen, how God should judge the people according to him, and, and really, if you look at this text, he cares more about a tree than he did for the people. I'll close out by reading verse 10. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? Wow. We care more about things. Things and stuff. More about things and stuff than we care about people. God should rebuke us all. And Pastor Gary, that really, really falls in line with, um, now see, this is why we need musicians because we need some music by the, from the musicians. Don't worry about it, media people. But, but what I do want to share with you, <laughs> what I do want to share with you is um, something that we have been uh, praying about in Wednesday, on Wednesday. Um, as we were praying on Wednesday, Pastor Gary, I don't necessarily share everything with Pastor Gary that's going on on Wednesday, because I don't want it to cloud his mind from hearing from God for the following Sunday. So what was happening is we were praying, and you can feel the power of Holy Spirit. You can feel him. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, it felt like we would hit a wall, and then it wouldn't, it wouldn't go any further. And then mm -hmm. we would pro begin to prophesy, and then we would, we would go in further, and then it would feel like we hit a wall, and it just kept doing that. And then a prophet stood up and said, I see a spirit that is extra large, uh -huh. obese, and the spirit is sitting there eating and eating and eating, but the spirit is not moved by the prayers. The spirit is not yes. moved by the word of God. And the more we prayed, the more it began to hunker down. Mm. And I went home and I started to really pray about this thing. Once, when I got home, when I got home, my son said, I had the exact same dream a week ago, but I didn't remember it until the prophet said that they saw this spirit. Right. And so I called the prophet on the phone and I said, and I didn't listen to the dream first. That's why you got to be connected with things that are invisible as well as things that are visible. And he began to tell the dream. The dream was exactly what was what the prophet had said in the in the prayer, wow. in the prayer, during the prayer. And anything that is in the that is prophesied should be backed up with scripture. Mm -hmm. So I was praying and listening to things. In Ezekiel 16, 49 through 50, the prophet Ezekiel said of Sodom, mm. look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. Ezekiel's getting ready to tell the iniquity of Sodom, which is a city. Right. She and her daughter had pride, mm. fullness of food, which is gluttony, and an abundance of idleness. So that spirit that was sitting there that was not moved by the word of God and was not moved by the prayers, it was the same spirit that was in Sodom. She and her daughters, 
That means there was a family line of pride, gluttony, and idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. So because the spirit indulged in pride and gluttony and being idle, that spirit rest and rules and abides in the hearts and the minds of the church and prevents the church yes. from strengthening the hands of those who are in the city. Mm. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. Mm. But remember, there was a man of God that prayed yes. and Lot was saved. Lot is symbolic of a remnant. And so if you come to prayer on Wednesday, we're going to be praying against this spirit of Sodom that causes us as individuals to be idle, to be gluttonous in our food, in our things. And Pastor Gary was saying it's not about things and stuff. It's not about what we want. Yes, so yes, we're yes. coming against that spirit that causes us to be idle and full of pride and gluttonous with food and things and stuff. The Lord has said to us in prayer, this is what is preventing the glory of God from coming to the church. Remember, we are the temple, which yeah. means that, that that temple doesn't necessarily reside in here, but it resides in here. So when we look at the lesson of Jonah, we understand that he was a prophet and he was a very powerful prophet. We understand that he had the ear of God. And we also see in the text that when he prayed, God answered his prayer. But he had something in his heart that God was not pleased with, and that's rebellion. He only wanted to prophesy and do the things that he saw fit. He only wanted to do his will. So for us who have that Jonah spirit, I want to share a scripture with you. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The only way that we're going to get rid of this rebellious spirit, 1 Corinthians 13, we're going to look at verses 4 through 8. Charity suffereth long. Another word for charity is love. Love suffereth long and is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It it is not puffed up. So we can see that Jonah did not have love. He didn't have it in his heart. He only had it for a certain amount of people. He didn't have it for everyone, right? So he did not show this love. He was puffed up with pride. Let's continue. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Did he behave unseemly? He acted like a child throwing a tantrum tantrum with God, right? It's like, God, you will give me what I want. This is what I want. You will do it for me. And God basically looked at Jonah and said, who do you think you're talking to? Let's continue. Does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil. Verse 6, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. To verse 8. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Charity or love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Can I read it from the New Living for those yes. who need a better and, understanding? And I want you to understand that God showed love to three groups of people in the story of Jonah. He showed love to the sailors. He showed love to Nineveh. And he showed love to Jonah. Do you see that in the text? Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Mm. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. 
prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. It's amazing that when we look at the story of Jonah and we look at the three groups, the most rebellious person is the one that knew God. The most rebellious one is the one that knew God. The sailors had idols. Nineveh had all kind of idols that they worshipped. But the very one who was given the gift, the very one who knew the sovereignty, the sovereign king, is the one who was full of pride. So, Pastor Gary, that means that we can operate in our gifts and still be far away from God. We can operate in our we can operate in our gifts, but remember that gift belongs to to the body. It belongs to the body, right? It, he he said I gave the gifts for the edification of the body, right? But when you say there's a certain part of the body that shouldn't have the gift, then you're not operating the way God intended the gift to operate, so that someone in the body is in lack. Because we refuse to show love. Did you enjoy this lesson today? Yeah.